this unit, we will deal with the limits on the efficiency of solar cells. In this context, we will also look at various solar cell materials. In the last teaching units, we got to know all the essential parameters that describe the electrical behavior of a solar cell. In addition to all these parameters, the quality of a solar cell also depends on how well it comes up to the maximum possible efficiency. Let us first deal with what are the physically achievable limits for the degree of efficiency. As we have already learned, the efficiency results from the product of the fill factor, short circuit current and open circuit voltage divided by the incident radiated power. The efficiency is therefore largely de determined by the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current. The limits of these two values are important for the limits of efficiency. Let's take another step back. You remember the photo effect lifts electrons from the valence to the conduction band. If a photon has less energy than the band gap, the energy is not sufficient to lift the electron into the conduction band. The photon transmits through the semiconductor. One could also say that the semiconductor is invisible to the photon. If a photon has more energy than the band gap of the semiconductor, an electron is lifted into the conduction band, but it immediately falls back to the energetically most favorable state in the conduction band and releases the excess energy as heat. Both quantities, open circuit voltage and short circuit current, depend on the band gap. The larger the band gap, the larger the potential barrier between the conduction and valence band and thus also the voltage that the solar cell can deliver. The open circuit voltage therefore rises almost linearly with the band gap energy. The short circuit current depends on the number of electrons that are raised into the conduction band. The solar spectrum contains photons with different energies. Thus, in order for the very low energy photons to contribute to the photoelectric effect, the band gap would have to be small. On the other hand, the larger the band gap, the lower the short circuit current, since fewer photons contribute to the photoelectric effect. The product of open circuit voltage and the short circuit current is important for the efficiency. Due to the profile of the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current, this product is zero for very small and for very large band gaps. Somewhere in the middle, however, a maxim man maximum can be found. In other words, there is a band gap for which the efficiency is maximum. Let's try to find this optimum. In order to do that, we need to take a closer look at how the short circuit current relates to the band gap. In contrast to the open circuit voltage, the dependency is not linear. Rather, it is related to the distribution of photon energies in the sunlight, or in other words, the light spectrum. In the last tutorial, you already got to know the AM1.5 spectrum, which is shown here again. The spectrum is typically plotted versus the wavelengths. Let us repeat briefly. The energy of a photon is inversely proportional to the wavelengths. Light with a small wavelength has a high energy. Light with a high wavelength has a low energy. We can also express the photon energy needed for the photoelectric effect as a wavelength. We have called this the cutoff wavelength. In case of silicon, the band gap energy is 1.12 electron volt. This corresponds to a wavelength of 1120 nanometer. At higher wavelengths, the photon energy is not sufficient for the photoelectric effect and the photons transmit through the semiconductor. At wavelengths lower than the cutoff wavelengths, as the wavelength decreases, a larger and larger fraction of the photon energy is lost as thermalization losses. 
Let's return to the open circuit voltage and the short circuit current. While the open circuit voltage depends significantly on the band gap energy, the number of photons below the cutoff wavelength is decisive for the short circuit current. For simplicity, let us assume that all photons below the cutoff wavelength are absorbed and that no losses occur during the transport of charge carriers. For this case, a maximum possible efficiency can be calculated as a function of the cutoff wavelengths. For silicon with a cutoff wavelength of 1100 nanometer, the theoretical efficiency is 32.9%. This is the maximum possible efficiency for a silicon solar cell. So far, we have looked exclusively at silicon as a semiconductor material. But what about semiconductors with other band gaps? With a larger band gap, the photons need more energy to lift electrons into the conduction band. In the spectrum, this becomes clear by the fact that the cutoff wavelengths become smaller. This decreases the number of photons contributing to the photoelectric effect. However, since more energy is now required for the photoelectric effect, the thermalization losses decrease at the same time. As the band gap becomes smaller, a larger and larger portion of the radiation is transmitted. In the extreme case of a very large band gap, almost all the energy is lost due to transmission losses and the theoretically possible efficiency is only a few percent. The opposite is the case when we consider materials with a small band gap. Since the energy required for the photoelectric effect is now lower, more photons can contribute to the photoelectric effect. The cutoff wavelengths increases and transmission losses decrease. But at the same time, the thermalization losses increase since many photons now have much more energy than they needed for the photoelectric effect. If we now reduce the band gap further, the thermalization losses increase more and more. In the extreme case of a very small band gap, a large part of the energy is therefore lost as thermalization losses. Somewhere between these two extreme cases of a very small and a very large band gap, an optimum can be found. The relationship between the maximum possible efficiency and the band gap was first described by Shockley and Quiser and is known as the shockley quiser limit. Here you can see the theoretical maximum efficiency that can be achieved depending on the band gap of a solar cell. The small waves in the curve are caused by the cores of the solar spectrum. If we were to calculate the theoretical efficiency for a different spectrum, the shape of the curve would change. The curve shown here refers to the AIM 1.5 spectrum. You can see that the highest efficiency can be achieved at band gaps between 1.1 and 1.4 electron volt. Silicon is exactly in this range with a band gap of 1.1 electron volt. In reality, however, this radical efficiency is not achieved. For example, the efficiency re record for silicon solar cells is currently 26.7%, although over 32% would theoretically be possible. This is because in our consideration of theoretical efficiency, we have, have assumed that all photons are absorbed and contribute to the photocurrent. However, in a real solar cell, there are a number of losses, for example, reflection losses, recombination losses, and others. These losses can be minimized, but in practice it is not possible to reach this radical efficiency. Besides silicon, there are, are a number of other important materials for photovoltaics. For example, gallium arsenide, with a band gap of 1.42 electron volt. Real gallium arsenide solar cells have reached efficiencies of even 28 to 29 percent. Another material is cadmium telluride, with a band gap of 1.45 electron volt 
and a record efficiency of 22.1%. These materials differ from crystalline silicon in one key aspect. They absorb light much more strongly. As a result, solar cells made of these materials can be much thinner. Here a thickness of 1 to 2 micrometer is sufficient, while silicon solar cells are usually 150 to 200 micrometer thick. This field is therefore also known as thin film photovoltaics. We have now learned that the efficiency that can be achieved with solar cells is limited. While on the other hand it is very motivating to get closer to this theoretical limit, one can also ask oneself whether there is a possibility to overcome these limits. There are several approaches for this, of which I would like to briefly mention the most obvious one, multiple solar cells. In a multiple solar cell, several solar cells with different band gaps are stacked on top of each other. In this way, a larger part of the spectrum can be used. As an example, a three-layer triple solar cell is shown here. The top cell has the highest band gap. It absorbs mainly short wavelength light. Long wavelength light is transmitted and hits the middle cell. This cell has a somewhat smaller band gap. It absorbs light in a medium wavelength range, here symbolized as green, but it is more a spectral range around 750 nanometer in the red and near infrared region. The lowest cell has the smallest band gap and absorbs in the long wavelength range. With such a structure, the efficiency can be increased significantly. For example, the peak value for a triple solar cell is currently 37.9%. However, most multiple solar cells are very expensive and are therefore mainly used for space applications. This might, however, change in the future as cheaper large band gap semiconductors like perovskites, which can be combined with silicon to a tandem device, are being developed and their problems in terms of long-term stability are being solved. I summarize this teaching unit. There is a theoretical efficiency maximum that depends on the band gap of the solar cell material. Furthermore, we have seen that the efficiency limitation can be circumvented by using, for example, multiple solar cells. Thank you for your attention.